my talk here is regarding media streaming and uh, the first half we'll talk about the history of media streaming and towards the later half we'll be talking about uh, mpg dash which is like uh, which i'll explain uh, when it comes so uh, uh, like to begin with uh, the technology that uh, streaming started with is known as mpg transport stream or commonly just uh, referred to as transport stream uh, this uh, is uh, like we know about mpg mpg that we got in our cd players uh, those mpg when it is packetized and then we add some error connection and synchronization to it then it becomes a mpg packet stream now why is this uh, we add packetization because uh, cd players are analogs analogous and then we can read on our computers but when we have to transmit it through a network, we need to uh, make it into network packets. That is, that is where packetized ele elementary stream comes in. Uh, now, uh, when we are playing from CD or any such media, we do not need to care about uh, whether we are going to have some losses there or not. Because we, we are, we, like, if there are going to have any losses, we'll be having a new CD or something like that. Uh, but for networks, we always need to take care about uh, losses, packet drops, etc. So there is error connection and synchronization because uh, MPG transport stream is also was also or is also capable of live streaming. So when we have uh, lo lost the track of where we are, we need to know from where do we need to begin. That is where synchronization pattern ne needs to be there. So it is used uh, like uh, as of now, uh, where this is currently used is if you buy some webcams or any IPTVs, uh, ge they generally use this uh, technology. Uh, more or less, it, uh, I'll explain why it falls out and where are its pitfalls. Uh, one thing important to mention is uh, it is a constant bitrate. Uh, it has to be transmitted as constant bitrate media. That does not mean that it cannot be compressed. The compression should be uniform. Something like a 10-minute uh, segment should always correspond to a one-minute uh, uh, like uh, network, uh, network stream, something like that. That is because the players need to adjust like the players uh, from where the era MPG uh, transport team comes from that is around 20, 25 years old. Uh, we needed to have this in place so that cl uh, the clients or the people who are playing it can properly play it. So uh, now coming to the problems, uh, why it fall off or why we do not see it uh, enough now. Uh, the major problem is it is broadcaster controlled. What I mean by broadcaster control is, uh, I as a broadcaster, broadcaster is the one who presents the stream. Uh, when I present the stream, you, as a client, what you can do is just tune into the broadcast and then uh, like play whatever uh, network packets, decode those network packets, play whatever you get. And then if you are kind of having any issues, you are out of luck. That is how the, it was built on. The other thing is, it was at that time, these systems were used generally for networks where we, uh, where the people had a control over QoS. What QoS is, it does prioritization of packets, where I'll tell that you can uh, deprioritize other packets that are not relevant and prioritize my uh, packets of streams so that there is no losses, et cetera. Now, how uh, this changes in our current system, uh, there might be a server that is streaming in US and you are here in India want to uh, take the stream. There are going to be a lot of uh, packet losses and that the network uh, will not be always smooth. There won't be a QoS in between the gateways. So you are going to fluctuate up and down. And this fluctuation up and down will, uh, there's very little that you can solve with a buffer. Uh, buffer is something that you pre-cache, uh, like you uh, st stay, uh, you take some amount of uh, frames beforehand, and then you play a little, you lag a little behind, and you play according to that. So there is uh, there there were problems, and since it was a very uh, old technology, not old, I would say at that time it was pretty good. Uh, so it was tied to MPG one and MPG two, and then it was not kind of uh, re renewed because. Uh, the interest went other, other, at other places. It was not working out very well. So it is very uh, uh, tightly coupled with MPG1 and MPG2 and cannot leverage the newer uh, kind of, say, video compression or encoding uh, uh, innovations that uh, came uh, ahead. 
and one, partly it was because of the constant bitrate that I mentioned before. Now enters RTMP or Flash as we know it. Uh, RTMP has been uh, in the industry for around uh, uh, 12 or 13 years. Uh, it was originally uh, made by Macromedia, which was later uh, acquired by Adobe. And uh, this RTMP is an application layer protocol uh, which works on TCP port 1935 by default. Uh, you can work it on any other place. Uh, what it generally does is it encaps encapsulates a flash file. Flash file can be either a, have a MP3 and AAC audio and MP4 and FLV video. And we also had options of RPC using the RTMP, but that is not relevant to our video streaming here. And all the packetization was done by action message format, uh, AMF. Again, uh, something built by Adobe. Now, the benefit that we get here, the major benefit, I would say, that we get here over the trans uh, transport team that we uh, talked about a little back, is that the stream size can be negotiated dynamically between the client and the server. Now, how does this benefit? Uh, this benefits because if I am a slow, then I'll tell the server to send me the packets a little slower, something like that. So that was the major changes uh, along, uh, along with other changes that it conformed to the newer, uh, I would say, network uh, strategies that came through over that era. Also, since uh, like w when we moved forward, we uh, thought that there are a lot of places where the other ports are blocked. So even then, uh, there was something known as RTMP tunnel uh, or RTMP TNT. What it does was it encapsulated this uh, action message format or the whole RTMP tunnel inside an uh, HTTP request. Everything sounds fine, worked perfect. We used it for maybe 10 years or something. Now, what, why it needed to change? The thing is, it is proprietary format. Uh, in fact, before uh, Adobe released its spec in 2012, uh, other people had to reverse engineer the protocol to understand it, and Adobe sued, uh, sued them. So it was not a win-win situation for anybody. Uh, plus, uh, the, like till now in my talk, I've never mentioned about something where if my network is not capable to play at the rate of what you are broadcasting, I'm still at uh, a loss. Like if I want to watch a live stream, I do not want to watch the match ending half an hour later than when it should end, right? So this was also a problem. Uh, there were ways, there were not hacks, I would say. There were ways, but not very standardized ways of having multi-bitrate uh, streams in here. The, since it is proprietary, uh, what happened is it is always stuck to Flash. Flash, as we know it, uh, like I mentioned before, that it supports MP3 and AAC, and in MP4, to be specific, S264 and FLV video. So uh, if, uh, you, if you have heard about uh, S265 or something like this, we cannot use those innovations here. So because it is like we are stuck. And then again, the DRM, that DRM is uh, some, uh, a way in which uh, if I suppose, like I can explain it better with an example, I'm Netflix and I'm transmitting you the video uh, and you want to save that video. Like everybody would want to save the video, why not? But then I, it is a loss for me. So I want to make sure that it is not allowed by your client or by the network to decrypt and save it. That is where DRM kicks in. A DRM is a fairly advanced concept. If I get time, I'll touch it towards the end. Uh, for uh, Till that time, I'm just putting it off the shelf. Uh, now, the Adobe had uh, this, uh, RTMP had DRM limitations. We could only use the DRMs that were uh, given by uh, the uh, Adobe in the spec. And then we know that uh, around maybe two, three years back, all the browsers started siphoning out Flash from their ecosystem. So now what do we do? So uh, like as we all are uh, developers here, we might think that what's the point of my talk? Uh, like we can just uh, have a media file and then we can put it behind Nginx. We can allow uh, uh, bytes, uh, byte range uh, access. By byte range access, what I mean is uh, I can access a file not always starting from the start, but from the middle as well. So that, and it is web optimized. And then I, in the client side, I'll just include it in a video SRC and it will start playing. Thanks to the, like, the browsers having been so advanced. So what's the problem in this? Why can't I use this? Uh, the answer is A, we are missing out a, a big chunk of information that is uh, the metadata that is at the start of the file 
defines a lot of things, including the file size. And if there is a live stream, we do not know what the file size is. So we are basically on a partial uh, information, and that cannot be handled. So at least by the standard spec of uh, MP4, there might be hacks, but we are not uh, talking here about hacks. So and another thing, we are still not uh, even if I uh, put up a video, that also has a specified bitrate. If I cannot ingest that bitrate, I'm still stuck. Like the we, what we can do is we can put out five videos of different bitrates, but there won't be a very easy way to switch between those bitrates, at least by the players implemented by the browsers. So now uh, talking a little about the history or when Flash was phasing out. The primary, uh, I would say, force was Apple, uh, who denied including Flash in any of their ecosystem. So now what it meant was uh, uh, Apple had to bring in some tech to replace Flash. And uh, when Apple started working on something, which later on came to be known as Apple HTTP Live Streaming, HLS, which is widely famous and kind of is uh, like uh, the fallback mechanism that is used today. I'll talk about the main mechanism that is coming on later. Uh, along with App, uh, Apple, Microsoft, and Adobe, both started implementing some sort of mechanism. And all of these mechanisms were based on the same fundamental. What the fundamental is? Adaptive bitrate streaming. And how it works is we split the media file that we have into chunks or uh, uh, fragments, however we want to take it, of maybe two seconds, one second, it depends on us. or specified by the spec of HLS, MSS, something like that. And then we give these chunks to the clients, and the clients take these chunks and kind of play them uh, without gaps. Now, this uh, seems to be pretty straightforward. What it enables us is, uh, suppose I see that my network is not able to keep up with the download of a chunk, I'll tell the uh, server that I'm not able to keep up. Can you give me something of a lower bitrate? Now, all of this information that uh, uh, all of this information of all the bit rates generally happens using manifest files. All of these implementations by Apple, Microsoft, and Adobe had different manifest files that posed a problem. Now, what uh, advantage it g gave us was uh, the uh, we can we are free to use like uh, the manifest needs to come from the server that we talk. The streams or the uh, I would say the fragments that we are talking about can be served from any location nearby us that is faster, uh, fastest for us to reach, that is leveraging our CDN technologies that is available today. So it all sounds very good. Where it falls apart is all of these individual implementations had were coupled to codecs, some codecs that each of the platform thought were the best. And second, they had their independent uh, DRM implementation. For Apple, it's Fairplay. For Google, it's Widevine, things like that. And then even the segmentation, as in how long can a segment be? I said two seconds. You want to put a 10 seconds uh, segmentation? No, you're not allowed. Something like that. Like uh, spec has a segmentation uh, kind of protocol. So all of these things uh, were not open, I would say. And contemporarily, all these uh, independent implementations existed. So we needed to unify it. Plus there was uh, one more uh, problem that was there, the playback. Uh, the playback of uh, HLS is kind of widely supported, but as of today, it's still not supported on Windows Safari, something like that. That is an uh, Apple product. So this made the ecosystem fragmented, not good for our, like, if we are progressing, then it's fine, but we were not progressing. We are stuck fighting each uh, other implementations. So now enters MPG Dash. What MPG Dash is? Uh, it is by the same group, MPG. MPG stands for Motion Pictures Experts Group, uh, uh, Open Association. Uh, it fo put forward Dash, which is known as Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. Uh, I will give you a pre-hand information that as of today, it is used in U uh, YouTube over for 90% of the videos, both for live and static. It is used in Netflix, BBC, uh, Twitch, and most of the content providers that you talk uh, think about. So it is uh, already been accepted. The fallback generally is the HLS that I used to talk about a little back. Uh, it is an ind uh, independent open international standard where all of these players, the major uh, media industries, have their representatives and think tanks in. Uh, now what majorly it does is it phases out Flash for uh, HTML5 media source extensions, or MSE. I'm going to explain it uh, further in the coming slides. 
Second, it standardizes the DRM implementation via HTML5 encrypted media extensions or EME. This is something that I won't be talking about. Uh, uh, it uses TCP over HTTP, so we can utilize all the HTTP goodies that we have researched on for years, HTTP2, or anything that we can think of, we can utilize it uh, here. And it is codec agnostic. That means we are free to plug in the codec that we want. Now, obviously, it depends on the client that are they able to play it. But yeah, I am able to give you a video that is uh, of any codec. So now, what are the main, uh, I would say, building blocks of this dash? There are majorly three components that uh, make this dream true. Uh, one would be manifest file .mpd. This manifest file, I am going to explain it a uh, little further for more clarity. Then the segments. Segments can be like any time later. Uh, we can always take our media consumption as two types because they are very separate uh, uh, types. One is a static media. Static media, uh, like as a content producer, I produced a video, and now you, as per your timing, want to just uh, ingest it. Maybe a word or maybe a uh, uh, music video that you want to watch. So that is static media. And the other is live media that is currently being broadcasted. And if we want to have the lowest latency possible for others to consume it. So these two are the different uh, kind of, say, spectrums of things that we are going to uh, talk about. Uh, so in case of live streams, we cannot give, uh, we cannot have one singular files. We'll always have to uh, kind of split the files into fragments. And like, uh, I, if I'm the producer, broadcaster, uh, every uh, I'll buffer all my frames for past two seconds, make it into an MP4 or WebM or something like that, and then I'll push forward that fragment. That fragment will later on be handled by us. Second thing is, uh, if it is static, we can again use the fragmentation, but that will incur cost to us. Why should we fragment a, a static file that we already have? So there we can leverage our uh, byte range uh, access, and we can actually we'll serve different fragments but all, all of those fragments will be a byte range of like telling that from one second to two second is from this byte to this byte from two seconds to three seconds is from this byte to this byte so this kind of makes it look like a fragment but actually in our servers it is stored as a contagious file now third is the msc that we are going to talk about so now mpd or media presentation descriptor the manifest file that we have been talking about it's agreed as an xml uh, we are not uh, arguing about that. Uh, dynamic, it uh, like it tells the client who is going to consume it whether it's a dynamic or uh, static, so that they can uh, like handle it accordingly. What is the biggest change that will come shifting from a dynamic to static is if we hit a server for a asking for an MPD for static videos, we the server will give us give us the same MPD throughout because they already have the whole file in place. But for live it will give us kind of the last maybe 10 seconds or 100 seconds. And every time we hit the server, it will always give us the last 100 seconds. So that will change uh, every time. I, it will be better with an example that will come uh, forward. So uh, now there is one very big advantage that comes with this uh, fragmentation and segmentation that I'm going to highlight here. I, as a content producer, uh, have videos in several resolutions. I also have several languages that I need to, uh, several audio languages that I need to broadcast in. And those, again, those audio streams have, again, different bit rates. So if I were a content producer in the, like, 10 years back era, what I'll have to do is, for each of these permutations, I'll have to put out a different stream. Now, I don't have to do that. What I do is, in the MPD, this is uh, just for pictorial representation. This is all in an XML schema that we might uh, be looking at a little later. So the, this type of format will be given to the client. The client will be telling or asking himself, what do I need to play? Uh, depends on defaults or whatever, however the client wants to configure itself. What I need to play, it will choose maybe one language, one bitrate and uh, audio, and another, uh, another bitrate, uh, bitrate uh, video. It will individually fetch those two segments, mux them, mux as in for audio it will use this, and for video it will use this and then start playing it. As soon as it uh, completes playing of segment 0, it will start playing the segment 1, and so on and so forth. It is very simple concept, just that uh, all of these descriptors have a spec attached to it, given in an XML. So uh, for a live video, this is actually an example of an XML. 
as well. Uh, this is the exact XML that uh, is given. It is obviously a little longer. I've just put in out a small uh, relevant uh, section of it. So this is an example that is for a live stream. In a live stream, what happened was uh, the fragment of this live stream has 10 fragments for it. Uh, when I fetched uh, the same MPD, I asked the server for a new MPD. It gave me, it removed the 10th uh, one out and it inserted the new fra fragment in. It has all the other information, like what is it width, uh, what is the codec that is there, everything else. Like uh, all of these things are there. Uh, we are not going to talk more about it because it is fairly simple. Uh, the spec specifies something you need to give into the XML. XML. Now, according to your needs, we generate that XML, and that is uh, open-ended, how you want to do it, kind of thing. So now, moving forward to media source extensions. Uh, why do we need it, first of all? Uh, when I talked about our Nginx example of sharing a static file, I mentioned that in the video tag, we'll give a, a video file in there. Now, in that video file that we have presented in there, the browser will start playing. Because it is a static file, everything will work fine. Now, here, we do not have a contagious one media file across for us. We have several media files or uh, fragments that we call with us. So what uh, Media Source API does is it is an extension to HTML media element. And it enables uh, us to have JavaScript, uh, like allow us to have a buffer and JavaScript to fetch individual media fragments and add to that buffer. So now we can correlate. We had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of segments. All of these segments are fetched by JavaScript using fetch or XHR, however we want to implement our client. Uh, that is if you are seeing in browser. If you want to uh, implement something in Android or any other platform, we'll do it accordingly. Uh, we'll fetch it as per the HTTP standards. And then we'll add it to the uh, the buffer that we have, and the browser will play it. So this is the kind of the powerhouse or the main reason why it works in browser nowadays. Now DRM implementation, I'll come back if uh, I have time left. Uh, now uh, I'll come to production strategy. Now as a uh, content producer, I want to know how do I actually produce these uh, live streams because uh, segmentation and all of these things do not look very stand for, uh, straightforward. So uh, like if you have heard of FFmpeg, M FFmpg, however you want, uh, want to pronounce it, that is like the leading toolkit for media. And basically, every most of the organizations use it in their arsenal for handling media because of its wide array of support of uh, uh, input, output, uh, uh, and several codecs, as well as several filters that uh, we can enhance to. It is open source and being developed for past 10 years or so. So what we'll do is uh, our input, just uh, for an example, suppose is a, uh, a webcam that we need to put forward to the industry, uh, to our clients. So uh, we'll use the FFmpeg command to, uh, and we, the uh, audio is from a webcam, and uh, our, uh, sorry, video is from a webcam, and audio is from a mic that is on a separate uh, channel. So the we write FFM, FFmpeg command. I won't explain it, and you even need not know it. The thing is, it is totally dependent on what you want to do and how you want to do. But basically, the idea is around, uh, we'll take or we'll specify the input audio you have to take from this, input video you have to take from this. We can specify multiple audios as well to give multiple channels. It depends. And then we output a, we output a he header files for audio and video of resolutions that we want. And then this header file is then again put into an FFmpg command, uh, which generates the manifest, live manifest for us. This live manifest will be served by any HTTP server that we want. And then uh, this will give you us the uh, kind of the uh, recent uh, fragments that have to be shown by the players. Now our consum uh, consumption strategy. As a producer, I produce these fragments, MPDs, and now it's on you to consume. Uh, as of now, I would say browsers do not natively do not play MPDs. Some do, some don't. It is not a very good state, but we are progressing at it uh, because all of the giants are on it. Uh, so uh, generally, we what we use for browsers, we use dash.js library that is produced by the Dash Industry Forum, uh, all of the players that are behind it. And then they handle all of this 
kind of selecting streams and adding the frames to the buffer and playing it, etc. Whatever we uh, may, ca uh, may call it, they also have a sample player in it, so that if we do not want to fiddle with implementation, we can just feed in our MPDs and they'll play. Google has Google Shaka player, uh, which is uh, used, uh, and Exo player that is used extensively on Android. So uh, Android actually has very nice support for uh, Dash streams. Now, uh, this if we are not on browsers or not on JavaScript, how do we consume it? Uh, it's kind of straightforward. We first ask for the MPD. Now, when we get that MPD, we check which streams we pass that XML. And when we pass that XML, we check which streams do we need to uh, kind of want to consume our consumption, maybe anything that we want to do. And then we'll fetch them. Everything is on HTTP, so we fetch them like we fetch any other file on HTTP and then do whatever we want with the audio and video segments that we have received. Now, this is for a fairly simple implementation. Now comes the some interesting parts. First is mirroring. Uh, what uh, I, as a uh, producer, uh, gave a MPD to one of the regions. Now I want this uh, to be mirrored across all the regions with lower latencies. For a normal video stream, it would have been difficult. For this, it is actually then, again, very easy. What I do is, in the mirroring server, I just fetch that MPD, and instead of selectively choosing the streams, I choose all of the streams, and then uh, like fetch them from there, and then change the MPD schema to include these new streams that I have. I want to uh, kind of give it out, something like that. Uh, this uh, like uh, I can I could have explained it in a more detail with a demo, but it was not possible. Uh, second is add insertion. This is one of the like the loveliest things the producers will want to do, and it becomes very simple. Earlier, when I, uh, like back then in the days of RTMP or transport stream, if I had to insert an ad, uh, I had a source of uh, video input, I had to break that input, insert an audio stream, and then play back, and then, uh, like this was very cumbersome, if you ask me. So now here, it is very simple. What I do is, I let my video stream go as is, I keep producing the, dash files as is. What I change is, instead of giving the client the dash of the video, I temporarily give him the dash of the uh, the ad advertisement. So what happens is, after he has consumed the fragments of the videos, he starts playing the ads. And then he'll go back to the uh, videos. So this is how you will see that if you are a user of Twitch or YouTube Live or anything th like this, uh, after games, uh, after a game or any uh, clip has ended, it is very easy for them to show an ad at any time they want without actually implementing much of resources on their end. So this is about ad insertion. Now clipping, again, everything is just passing the MPDs. Now for clipping, uh, clipping is, we were watching a live media. I want to have the past 15 seconds of the live media saved for myself. So this is what I meant by clipping. Uh, how do we do clipping? Fairly simple. Uh, I take that MPD and I keep asking for newer MPDs. Uh, just as a note, MPDs also have uh, information uh, where it tells how fast should you ask for MPDs. Like an MPD gives out 10 stream, uh, 10 segments, and those each segment can last for two seconds. So it is not good for the server as well as the client to keep asking for MPDs every second. So generally, the MPDs specify the time that minimum time at least when you should the uh, the time between two MPD requests that you should keep because it won't make a difference for you unless you keep get, keep getting all of the fragments uh, with you. So uh, talking about clipping, uh, in clipping we again uh, respect that MPD minimum uh, fetching time and then we ask and the part that we need to clip we save all of those media. All of those media will be like uh, uh, two second or uh, four seconds, something like this, specified in the MPD. Then we uh, all of according uh, along with saving all of those media, maybe in something like Redis or something like uh, media uh, in the disk. We also save the uh, timestamp that it belongs to. Uh, our live stream would have started at X time, and the fragment that we have fetched would have corresponded to a delta of plus X with relative to the start time. So we keep a note of this. And then finally, we figure out from what media to what media do we need to uh, merge all of the clips in. And then we merge all of these segments, and we have our clip. So this has made all of these operations pretty easy. And I'm proud to say that all of the bigger organizations are using it and pushing forward it. 
So uh, we'll uh, hopefully see more of it in the future. Uh, so that was my talk. Um, how it is different from Amazon Kinesis and uh, does it have any SDK like Amazon Kinesis provides for different different SDKs for Android and for Java and one more for .NET? Uh, frankly speaking, I have not used Amazon Kinesis. So I cannot uh, like specifically answer your question. Uh, if uh, like, can you explain me in a line or two what exactly that service does so that I can better like give you a hint? It's actually uh, the same service which provides uh, streaming based on segmentation. Okay, uh, now I understand what it might be doing. So basically, uh, I showed you some commands of FFmpeg uh, production, right? So this is a task that we need to use, uh, put in, uh, use FFmpeg in, and then generate the segments and MBDs. So this is a laborious task. Uh, from a uh, broadcaster's point of view. So if we do not want to do it ourselves, so we transload this task to Amazon and I probably think that that is what they are offering, if I'm not wrong. Means uh, I do not know about that service in detail to answer that question fully. Uh, you mean basically the segmentation we can do using FFMPD? Yeah, we like if we, uh, we ourselves, if we want to do segmentation, we can do it using FFMPG. But if you do not want to get into hassle of all of this yourself, you may use services offered by Cloudflare, Amazon, and so on to do this, uh, which uh, I assume is the product that you're talking about. Okay, and uh, how about uh, transferring this uh, uh, segments over the internet? Yeah, so uh, like uh, the power that comes with uh, this uh, thing is, it is all HTTP, right? Everything is served over HTTP. So once I have created a fragment, uh, we can, like Amazon uh, has a offering CloudFront, Using CloudFront, they can mirror it across regions and give it. So now what will happen is our MPDs might come from one source, but the uh, MPDs uh, segment information will point to the nearest CDN. So basically MPD, that is just the schema that we are having, will contain the information to get those streams from the nearest server that you have. So that is how we relocate our production uh, environment to kind of different places. Since every, like since everything here is via HTTP, it becomes very easy to use our existing technologies to do the same. The only thing in this mirroring will be we add a little bit of latency. So in live, uh, like kind of 20 seconds latency is bearable. So we'll add this maybe five seconds or more latency to mirror it across regions. I believe that will be the only uh, uh, counterproductive uh, block that we'll uh, figure out. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? Um, how do you handle the packet drop? How does the dash handle packet drop? Okay, so uh, dash as in does not ha handle the packet drop. Uh, now the clients, as in the ones who, ha who is consuming the packets, will be responsible for it. And how they do it is something like this. Uh, every dash gives you the last 10 segments right. The packet drop in this will basically mean that you were unable to download the one download in terms of HTTP, download one particular segment. Your fetch request failed. So when that fetch request failed, it will try to refetch it. If it again fails, then it will kind of blank out for a second. So it depends on the client implementation. Since we are not talking on, we are talking on the, the uppermost layer, we do not need to know the implementations of lower levels. Those packet drops, etc., et will be handled by the HTTP servers and all of those things. So uh, as a content producer and as a client, we should not be needing to figure this out. But if, yes, if there are a lot of packets that are dropping because of networks, first, it will be advisable to switch to a lower bitrate. What lower bitrate will also mean is that the file sizes will go small, and hence, we'll have a higher probability of successfully downloading a segment. So that is uh, one thing. And second, we can serve the, those medias using uh, to uh, the client or from their nearest edge location. So that will be the second strategy th that we can employ. Apart from this, there's not something from the DAS schema that we can do to uh, kind of eradicate packet drops. Okay, so uh, do the segment sizes vary based on the bitrate? Yeah, uh, like uh, well, frankly, as a user, why will I want to watch a video in 480 if I can watch it in 1080? Okay. The only thing that is uh, demarking it is the lower the bitrate, mm. 
the lower will be the uh, the size uh, because bitrate is uh, the amount of bits per second so since the bits per second is lower hence the size overall size of that fragment will be lower so do the uh, does at the client side do we download all the segments set one in one go or no uh, that actually defeats the like if i want to implement such a client i'm free to like nobody is stopping me for live generally it won't be even possible because for live you do not get all the segments at once okay. for static video as for example you are playing a video in youtube you see the buffering bar going up yeah. and if you pause that buffering bar also pauses it does not even uh, continue after that because it thinks that it is useless to download all of the segments at once it generally downloads some five segments or 10 segments in parallelly that is surely done a buffer is also maintained but the whole video downloading at once is generally not required i would say